Good evening and welcome to the second talk in the EDA Fleek lecture series. Since a lot of you are probably tuning in from overseas, let me just introduce the EDA Fleek quickly. The EDA Fleek is an organization that's built for the exchange and communication between ACA Fleeks. And ACA Fleeks in turn is short for the so-called Akademische Fliegergruppen, which in English translates to academic flight clubs. Those academic flight clubs um, comprise of university students who research, build, and fly sailplanes and motor planes of their own design. Our aim here tonight is to create an alternative while all of us cannot fly. And since this is only the second talk in this series, we're continuously improving and we need your feedback, so please just write it in the comments. Would be much appreciated. Let me introduce myself. My name is Dominic Pepe. I'm, of course, a member of Ida Fleek and also a member of Aka Fleek Karlsruhe. I'm currently also the project manager of the AKX, this beautiful glider you can see behind me. <laughs> but enough about us or me. Tonight's guest is Matthew Scudder. A lot of you have probably heard about him. He's made quite a name for himself in competition gliding. <laughs> He scored first place standard class in the Junior World Gliding Championships of 2015 and also first place standard class more recently um, at the Hanweide competition in 2019, just to name a few of his accomplishments. In 2017, Matthew founded SkySight, which he's here to talk to us about tonight. Before I hand over to Matthew, I'd just like to remind you that you can ask questions in the comments at any time we will collect them and Matthew will get a chance to answer them at the end. And now over to you, Matthew. G'day, thanks for tuning in tonight, everyone. Uh, so tonight I'm gonna to be talking to you a little bit about SkySight, the software product I've developed. It's a soaring weather forecast service. We cover just about all of the soaring world, anywhere people are likely to fly gliders, we do forecasts for. And I've spent a lot of time and uh, effort trying to think about the best way to present that information, the best way to run these models and I'm going to tell you a bit about what I think I've learned over the time. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to the Ida Fleeg for hosting us tonight. Um, I actually have a fairly long relationship with uh, Aka Fleeg. So the first time I came to Europe at all, I came for the Junior World Championships, I think in 2011 or 13 or something in Musbach. And I rented a LS1F, which had um, some quite bad problems from a dodgy repair on the wing that stopped me getting full aileron deflection to one side. And we talked to a few people and eventually got passed on. And some kids of the local Acker League, I think it was Acker League Stuttgart maybe, who um, took us and the glider. We rigged it in the halls of the university. So every time class had changed, there'd be students walking past us doing these glass repairs to the ailer on his glider, and paint fumes going everywhere. And uh, they were very helpful in um, fixing up the glider for me before I went to fly that first world championships of mine. So I'm very envious of the structure you have in Germany that. Um, as these university clubs and the support that's made available to make that possible. I wish we had that in the rest of the world. Um, so on with the talk. So a little bit about um, the company itself. So I sort of started doing forecasts myself maybe in 2013 or something. I took over a couple of the local RASPs and then um, coming up to the Junior World Championships in Narrow Mine in 2015, I started to think about uh, the ways things could be done better. Like I felt like I'd developed quite a bit of experience tuning and adjusting the model and trying to get some feedback loops going to improve it. Um, but I felt the presentation the information was still really lacking. So I tried to put together kind of user interface that my team might, might be able to understand and try and um, build something that's a little bit more user friendly than what was previously available while still having the best possible models. So this is basically the team as it looks now. There's a couple more people we work with on a less regular basis. Um, so there's myself, um, I do, let's say, the majority of the software development. Um, we work with a meteorologist, Roger. He also does all of the fancy JavaScript animations you see on the website, anything that moves, that was Roger. Um, my partner, Sophie, who does all the sales and marketing throughout Germany. And we've got a really good sales team assembling now who comes with us to all of the events all over Europe um, and do a great job um, doing presentations, doing sales in person. Um, and they're also... Um, uh, real top level pilots as well. So Jake Brattle on the left there was the junior world champion last year and Finn was the vice champion. And uh, it's, it's uh, feedback from pilots like these 
um, in particular young pilots, about um, what they'd like to see for the coming years to driving our development process and what we work on in the future. So before we um, get on to why we do things the way we do, I think it's important we all have a bit of background on how our model actually works, what it looks like, um, and that'll give you some understanding of why we do things the way we do. So the basic idea is to decompose the world into a grid. So you can see here we've got this little grid structure all over the ground here. You can see um, some slightly smaller grids over Argentina or South America, slightly larger ones over the ocean. Um, and that covers the whole world. And we can also see that these grids extend into space as well as little cubes. And the idea is we decompose it to that grid and we do forecasts just on each individual point of that grid and then do some differential equations to figure out how the air is going to move from one point in the grid to the other point in the grid. Um, so people often talk about, say, the resolution of a weather model, and what they're actually talking about is the distance between those grid points. And usually people talk about the horizontal resolution, that is the distance between the grid points on the surface there. Um, but actually for gliding, just as important is the vertical resolution, that's the spacing of these grid points going to space. So while on the surface, often you'll have a fixed grid point all the way around the world, or maybe a bit wider over the oceans or something like that. Uh, going into space, often you sort of have this logarithmic thing where you have many more layers near the surface and far fewer layers as you get out into space. Glider pilots aren't so interested in what's happening at 180,000 feet as they are at 1,800 feet. So we focus most of our layers down near the boundary layer. So this is uh, just an example of a 2D representation of what that grid might look like on the surface. And let's pretend it's just pressure, of course, temperature, dew point, all that matters as well. Um, we've got high pressure over here. We've got low pressure over here. It's one o'clock. We've got three kilometers between the grid points. What if we um, advance the time, do some differential equations, figure out how that's all going to change? And we can see in 10 seconds time, the pressure is going to get a little bit lower here. Pressure is going to get a little bit higher here. And eventually, this it all equalize out until the whole world is the same pressure. Um, but of course, we have inputs as well and outputs even. Um, so the sun is shining all the time, reducing the pressure in some places and adding energy to the system and we're radiating heat out all the time as well. So it never reaches a stable state, fortunately, otherwise it wouldn't be a great planet to go gliding on. Um, so now you've got that understanding of what the model looks like, we can start to talk about what characteristics define a better or worse model. So um, one of the most important things is having an accurate initial state. So if you don't know where you're starting from, it's very hard to tell where we're gonna end up. So there's plenty of places you can get that initial state from. So satellites is the name of the game these days. So satellites are everywhere. They're producing really highly detailed pictures. And it's not just visual pictures like you're used to looking at. Um, they're actually a composition of maybe 14 different channels, picking up various wavelengths of light, which can tell you all kinds of things you wouldn't imagine. Um, like you can pick up the water vapor or the stability of the atmosphere or the temperature of cloud tops, all kinds of things, but dust particle movement. Um, can all be derived from these satellites. Some satellites, um, by means I don't understand, can even do a kind of LIDAR thing where they're giving you a full temperature profile from the satellite down to the ground. Um, and the biggest problem these days is actually processing the sheer volume of data we're getting from satellites. Um, of course, temperature observations, surface observations, so what's happening on the ground from weather stations all over the place, still really important, particularly important for those um, conditions like is the inversion going to break, is the surface temperature going to get quite high enough? Um, the state of the world in terms of the terrain. Um, so fortunately, mountains don't move very often. So that's basically static. But things like uh, where there's crops planted, um, what season it is, it, um, are those crops uh, absorbing oxygen or exhaling CO2? Um, that can all have an impact on the weather. And it's very important to consider as well. So having databases of what crops planted, what time of year, um, as cities grow, and cities grow well, much quicker than mountains, I mean, databases where that, because that can have a huge impact on the forecast. You can see that on SkySight, even you can see how much stronger it is over urban areas. Um, and then, of course, one of the most important sources of initial data for a model like SkySight is actually other models. So a very common approach for when you're running a regional forecast, that is a forecast that doesn't cover the whole globe, um, is to use a larger model uh, for that initial data that's coming into your model region from outside. So when you look at SkySight for the European forecast region, you can see there's a border and we're not forecasting. We don't know what's happening outside that border. So we draw on parent models uh, for that source of information, what's coming into our model area. And that information then gets sort of refined once it gets into our model area with all that extra data we're adding. 
Um, so another important characteristic is how well you model the physical processes. So there's all kinds of physical processes going on in the atmosphere. So water is turning to ice. Um, when clouds form, there's latent heat released. Um, for clouds to form, in fact, you need little particles in the air for them to nucleate on. Um, there's, there's all these different processes that are, are basically infeasible to model. Even if we do ha know how they work, it's just not possible to model them as accurately as our understanding of how they work is. So we have to come up with approximations of how these things work um, that are more computationally efficient for us to be able to do them faster than real time. Um, even things like um, how the soil absorbs moisture and how that's um, wicked out by the sun, um, how plants grow. So less so models like us where we're just forecasting for a couple of days, but certainly climate models need to actually model the growth of plants and the decay of plants. Um, and you need to input whether humans are going to stuff that up or not. Um, so there's a whole range of parameterizations and optimizations and things we can fo focus on within one model or perhaps um, ignore within one model. So within SkySight, we're not so concerned actually about whether the plants are growing through the day or not. So we can save a lot of time and money by focusing that extra computational power on some of the more important things like the latent heat released when clouds are formed. Um, and then of course, the resolution. So high resolution is in almost all conditions um, superior to lower resolution. The returns do very rapidly start diminishing when you start to get below four kilometers. That does depend on the topology. So areas like uh, South Africa or Namibia, where the surface is very flat, the terrain is very homogeneous. Um, it doesn't particularly matter what kind of resolution you're running at. If you're running at four kilometers, 12 kilometers, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But areas that are much more complex, like I say the Andes or the Alps um, or the Sierras, for example, higher resolution, you definitely get benefits there um, to quite a significant degree. The problem is, um, so the parameterizations we have, these approximations, um, they've been written and tested, or they usually are written and tested with a certain uh, level of resolution in mind. Because as you start to get higher and higher resolution, like a, if you imagine the kind of um, modeling you do around the airflow on a wing, um, where the grid size, the modeling is basically the same as weather modeling, the grid size on that might be 0 0.1 centimeters or something like that. And things like turbulence, all these phenomena and boundary layer separation, they all just happen naturally by virtue of the model. Um, there's no additional parameterizations necessary for them. And then as that grid size gets larger and larger, you get uh, distance between those, those effects start to go away. So the really tricky thing is managing when you have a very high resolution um, and those effects are starting to become apparent by themselves. Do you leave the parameterization turned on or do you turn it off? At what point do you hand it over to um, the resolution of the model to do the hard work for you? That's the thing really delicate to balance. And in a lot of areas, it's not really well understood. So we'll talk about a gray area between, say, as various figures on this, somewhere between 100 meters of resolution and maybe four kilometers of resolution where you're really playing with fire. And it's really important to get it right as to having the highest possible resolution without starting to get problems from the performance of those parameterizations. And of course, not just the horizontal resolution as we talked about, uh, but the vertical resolution is really important as well. So having as many vertical layers as possible and having those vertical layers focused where it matters to you. Um, so for soaring forecasts, of course, we're very interested in what happens in the boundary layer. So the layer up to the top of thermals and then perhaps a few thousand feet above that. But then we're also interested in uh, layers of mid-level cloud or high-level cloud. They're very important to us. But above, say, 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet, mm, it's not so interesting to us. So there's optimizations to be made there and focuses to be applied there. Um, so let's talk about that resolution in a little bit more detail. Um, so this is a homegrown example from an area in uh, Australia. So you might have heard of Benella. Um, it's uh, somewhat of a notorious place to fly after we've had two world championships there with uh, not great weather, let's say. Um, so Benella is a bit of a unique site in that we have a very strong sea breeze almost every day that comes through the Australian Alps um, caused by the strong convection in land here. So the thermals are going up, they're sucking the air in that comes all the way in from the sea and causes that sea breeze. Now, for a long time, it was thought, um, well, rather, weather models thought that um, that sea breeze couldn't penetrate the Australian Alps just by virtue of their resolution. So as far as they would say, um, the thermals would be great at Benalla until very late in the day, when in actual fact, anyone who flew from Benalla would know that the sea breeze was coming in reliably at, say, 3 p.m., 4 p.m. or something and killing all the soaring. And if you're on final glide too late back to Benalla, well, you just wouldn't get home. Um, and the reason is, is you have these passes in the mountains. So this is one called the Nilakuti Gap. Um, I don't know how wide it is offhand, let's say 10 kilometers wide. 
And when we used to run very coarse weather models like a 36 kilometer resolution or even 12 kilometer resolution, they just wouldn't see these passes in the mountains. So we have a vertical cross section here. So you see the mountain there, you see the mountain there. And in reality, of course, the wind just blows straight through that gap. You can see from above here, the wind just blowing straight through. Um, and if you have a forecast point that happens to land on the top of this hill and a forecast point that happens to land on the top of this hill, as far as the model's concerned, this is just a wall of rock and there's no passage for the wind. So the sea breeze never comes through to vanilla. Whereas if you had a more detailed model, say with a forecast point every three kilometers, it can actually see the effect of the valley there and understand that the wind can filter straight through uh, this pass here into vanilla and kill all the soaring. So that's a really strong example of what the benefit of that higher resolution can be. On the other hand though, um, here I've got an example of a picture which um, I'm pretending is equivalent to 36 kilometers resolution. So I have um, two people on standby ready to comment on what they think this picture is. Uh, Dominic, would you like to tell me what you think this picture is of? It's hard to tell. Um, I don't know, maybe some sort of landscape. Uh, yep, so we got, we got a vague idea of what's going on <laughs> and that's kind of representative of what you get out of a 36 kilometer model. Um, so we can kind of get a, maybe a synoptic scale picture, let's say we can see maybe blue skies and some clouds in the sky. Are they good clouds? Are they bad clouds? What season is it? Where are we? These are still unanswered questions. If we bring the resolution up to about 12 kilometers, uh, maybe we have a bit of a better idea what we're looking at. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I can spot a clutter now in the, in the foreground. And, and yeah, some nice can you tell where we are? Clouds. Uh, no, maybe mountains, but apart from that, no clue. So we're starting to get a bit of detail here. We sort of know what we're looking at. And then let's bring it up to about six kilometers. Yeah, definitely Any ideas? a lot clearer. Um, well, it's looking like, like high mountains and, and a field in the foreground. And it looks like this glider shouldn't be in the field. <laughs> Can you tell what type of glider it is yet? Um, no, maybe standard class, 80 meter class, but apart from that. So let's get up to about three kilometers now. Yeah, way clearer. And for eagle eyed people, you might even know this is the Dolomites here. Uh, this is the valley running back to Lesse on the border of Italy, Slovenia, and Austria. One of my outlandings from a couple of years ago that I don't want to talk about. Um, so yeah, now we're starting to get a really clear picture. But the problem is those parameterizations I was talking about before and those phenomena where the model starts to naturally evolve things. Um, when you get up to, say, one kilometer resolution, the model is actually starting to resolve microscale phenomena like thermals all by itself. Um, so we have perhaps a parameterization for thermals that we've added for dealing with the resolutions where the model didn't resolve thermals and didn't resolve convection by itself. Um, and that's now mixing with uh, the model itself at its very high level of resolution, actually starting to model the formation of thermals, the hot air falling on the ground, separating from the ground and lifting away. Um, and the combination of those, or perhaps the, even the model by itself is um, not realistic. It's just not, not performing at a resolution that um, is sufficient to really resolve it, but it's just enough to stuff up the existing parameterization. Um, and you can actually see this on SkySight sometimes. So, I mean, we go to a lot of effort to try and run at the highest resolution possible. So where it can be bumping into this in locations. So this is an example I found in Australia somewhere. I think this was uh, at about two kilometers of resolution. And you can actually see that um, this is looking at a thermal velocity chart where the red is stronger thermals. You can see it thinks there's little spots of thermals forming in a grid shape like this. And that is actually, it thinks this grid point has a thermal, that one doesn't. And it's sort of like feeding off each one. So thermal, no thermal, thermal, no thermal. And they're forming in a grid like this, which as you know, isn't how thermals really form. Um, in fact, I think um, they're more like an octagon than a grid like this. Um, but you can see it's not realistic and it's created noise. And when people rely on the real high detail of our forecasts, maybe they're flying with them on their LX9000 or something. Um, we don't want them to be flying to little spots like this thinking that that's going to be a thermal or something like that so it's important that we don't expose this kind of noise to users and it possibly will have adverse effects on the actual prediction of the weather itself um, and the high resolution also can create real presentational problems as well so we really struggle with this in the mountains in particular and we've been working on a lot of features to try and improve the presentation of that so um, as the resolution of the model gets higher and higher uh, it starts to understand increasingly so that thermals only come from the very peaks of these mountains and they're not coming from the valley floors. So it looks like when you have a very cursory glance at a mountainous area that there's not really good conditions going on because you're seeing all these dark blue colors. You think maybe it's not a great day to go flying. 
when it's really just these very little narrow lines up on top that are perhaps even getting smoothed out how good they are. Um, if we just skip forward to, uh, so we're, this is the same location looking on the SkySight model and uh, the Icon model also within SkySight, Icon being considerably lower detail. You can see it looks like a much brighter and maybe happier picture on the Icon model just by virtue of that lower resolution. Um, so you can see how you can immediately see how these um, presentation problems can be de can develop if you don't take care um, to manage that additional resolution. So it's a, it's a bit of a poison chalice. It has to be um, uh, very carefully utilized. Uh, we see the same things with cumulus. So within um, flat areas, um, it's uh, it's showing anywhere there's potential for cumulus to form. So it shows a homogeneous uniform picture. You see big areas of cloud, um, perhaps like this, across the vast majority of flat areas, and um, because anywhere they could form a cloud. But then through this area of the Alps here, it's saying the clouds are just going to form just off these peaks here. So you see these long, narrow, slender lines of cloud just following the peaks. Um, and perhaps if you have a cursory glance at that, uh, you think there's not going to be very much queue. And indeed, it's misleading that it shows that Whereas this area here, where there is going to be considerably more Q, in fact, it thinks there's even going to be Q forming out of the valleys, you think there's proportionally less Q on the tops of these peaks here to out here, when that may not necessarily be true. Um, so it's really something we try and manage carefully, and we're trying to build better visualizations that better um, show that effect through the mountains. So recently through the mountains, for example, we've significantly amped up the display of cumulus coming from those peaks, show a much larger area um, to give pilots a better idea that it's actually a really nice day in the mountains and there is going to be nice queue off those peaks rather than thinking that it's going to be um, one eighth queue or something like that. And the same problem, of course, applies to the PFD. So a very simple PFD algorithm will really suffer in the Alps because it's seeing that all through this area here, all of these valleys, there's no thermals and it's just um, off these little peaks here, which then when you try and create a very broad map that shows big areas of good and bad, it's really challenging for a very simple algorithm to represent. So we've started doing some special tricks in the mountains as well now to try and show a better chart than you might see here on a good day. Because it's actually, it tries to do some intuitive understanding of uh, the peaks are good, so the whole area is going to be good. And we're still improving that as well. Um, so one of the age-old questions, um, is bigger better? So we talked about having a very high resolution can be important. But it's also important to have a very large forecast area. So you're only getting the benefit of that higher resolution if you're capturing those effects that are perhaps outside of the area you're going to fly, but moving into the area you're going to fly. So um, again, an example from home, uh, from Australia, we have a lake in central Australia that fills up about once every 10 years, and it's an enormous lake. It's bigger than some European countries. I think it's bigger than Belgium, for example. Um, and that can flood some years and other years it doesn't. And if we don't have accurate information about whether that's flooded or not in a given year, um, we see real significant decreases in the model performance, hundreds or even thousands of kilometers downstream because of that uh, lack of area of moisture evaporating um, and uh, being carried downstream and the influences that can have. So it's really important to have that large forecast region over a large area to be able to capture those benefits. So things like when you have wave a long way upstream, it can have huge downstream effects. Um, so we try and provide the biggest possible forecast regions in all our regions where possible. So you're really getting the benefit of things that perhaps are just outside the area you're actually interested in. So this is an example um, from the ISS. It's Guadalupe Island, somewhere off Mexico. Um, and you can see these downstream effects, hundreds of kilometers downstream. Uh, I think I've got this annotated here. <coughs> uh, you can see the convergence here. You can see a von Kármán vortex. You can see some maybe gravity waves that are probably not really connected with that, but they could be. Um, some more random examples I found on the internet. You can see these vortices going hundreds or thousands of kilometers downstream and really changing the Q field as a result. Um, so if that was blowing over land, that could have a real impact on your soaring. And uh, another one that I found completely inexplicable, um, these von Kármán vortices going downwind and then inexplicably turning 90 degrees. And I can't explain why that happens, but I hope the model would be able to resolve that and you'd be able to get the benefits of that downstream. And of course, the one you're most likely to be familiar with is the effects of wave. So Wave in places like Scotland will have downstream effects on northern France. So now I've talked about how models work, how you evaluate models. Now I'm going to give you some information about what the models that are out there actually are. So the model most people will have heard of or used in one way or another in their life is GFS. 
That's a model run by the United States um, Oceanic Administration. Um, the reason you see it everywhere is because it's free. Um, so basically every online weather service you see um, of any sort is uh, going to be deriving some or all of their data from GFS. Um, it has global coverage. It's fairly low resolution. The physics are pretty average. It has, it has moderate accuracy. Um, uh, and the output's freely available, and the output comes out every six hours. Um, another model uh, that we've started utilizing recently is the Deutsche Wetterdienst ICON model, um, which is considerably high resolution, um, particularly the European subset is a really quite high resolution. Um, its physics is quite good. Uh, it has global coverage via its parent ICON model. It has pretty good accuracy. And um, from the statistics I've seen, it tends to outperform GFS by a small margin. Um, but the really interesting thing for us is that its output is every three hours compared to six hours from GFS. ECMWF does a model um, which is medium resolution, not quite as high as the ICON model's Nest, but higher resolution than the ICON model's global model. Um, it has very good physics, it has global coverage, and it's widely regarded as the best performing global model. Uh, it has some real challenges um, as an initialization source. It's something we've tried to initialize from, and we continue to try to initialize from, but um, the output times that it comes out are really inconvenient for planning your flights in the morning. Um, and the parameters they're outputting are quite complex to calculate useful storing parameters from. And then you have a bunch of regional models. So we run a model called WARF, uh, WRF, which is a regional model. And that's uh, it's actually more of a framework than a model itself. Um, so it's kind of like a plug and play system. I don't know if you've ever built a computer by yourself, but you can plug in different graphics cards, different CPUs, things like that. Um, WRF is more like that. So you can really build anything with it. Uh, you can write your own code and plug it into other people's existing code, um, or you can leverage things you find on the internet. It's You can do anything with it. And the resolution is entirely up to you and are limited by the performance of the systems you have available, as is the area of coverage. And basically, any forecast that shows you a limited area is going to be running WARF, or there's a small chance they're running a number of other sort of similar kind of models like uh, Cosmo or like... Um, MPAS or something like that. So I think uh, the Deutsche Wetterdienst actually runs a Cosmo model just for Germany, which some pilots might be familiar with. Um, so yeah, that, it's very hard to comment on the performance of WARF in itself because you can do anything with it. In fact, um, some people suggest WARF isn't state of the art, and that's sort of fair because it's derived from code that's almost 40 years now. Um, and the, as a result, the performance often isn't great, but in terms of what it can do and the software, or the plugins and the physics modules people write for it, um, certainly, those are top performance. So, and that's in fact where a lot of weather research is done by writing those plugins for WARF. So, sort of breaking down how it works, WARF is this basic frame, overarching framework, and with that, you sort of get for free the dynamic solver. You get one of two options for that. Um, can't really plug in your own there. That's kind of the base of the model, and then you plug in models for the microphysics, for the modeling of clouds. <coughs> Excuse my cough. I picked up something. I'm traveling through China a couple of weeks ago. That's a joke. Um, radiation. So you can plug in modules for radiation. Uh, so the impact of uh, clouds in the atmosphere on the sun coming to the ground, of course. Um, if you don't have a radiation module, it just assumes the sun is homogeneous everywhere. The land surface model. So the heating and cooling of the surface of the ground from that radiation. So is it evaporating away moisture or is it getting hot? Um, how is that affecting the plants on the ground, or how do they affect the radiation back up to albedo? And the boundary layer modeling. So unless you're running extremely high resolution, um, you, need to ex you need to explicitly parameterize the boundary layer and come up with an approximation of uh, how the boundary layer is performing or forming. Um, so going back to those models again um, with a bit more detail about their resolution. Um, so GFS is global, and it's about 25 kilometers between those forecast points. ECMWF is about nine kilometers globally. The Deutsche Wetterdienst is 13 kilometers globally, but six kilometers within the European Union. Sky sites, so we run at uh, one to three kilometers variably, depending on the complexity of the topography and the soaring requirements. HRRR is a really high performing. It's actually WARF as well, across three kilometers across the whole United States. Um, and you're probably familiar with RASPs, which are anywhere between 36 kilometers over large areas um, to couple of kilometers in small areas. Um, so now I've briefed you on how models work and what the models out there are. I'd like to dive in a little bit more about the SkySight model and 
particularly the things we've come up with that enable us to, uh, I think, meet those criteria that I've arbitrarily defined to evaluate where the model's on. Um, so the big differentiator I feel that really enables us to do things differently is our use of cloud computing. Um, so previously we used to stick computers in racks, and I say we, I mean computer, or computer people in general. You put servers in racks, you spend, I don't know, a hundred thousand, half a million dollars buying these computers. You stick them in the rack, you pay hundred thousand dollars a year for the electricity and the internet for them, and they chug away. Um, the new way of doing things is to stick everything in the cloud. So you just instead buy servers by the second when you need them from Amazon or from Google. And the advantage to this is you only pay for them when you're using them. And when there's newer servers to be had, you just click a button and you're all upgraded. You don't need to go spend another half million dollars of capital buying these new servers. So that really enables us to do some interesting things as a result. So in terms of that accurate initial state, so um, we're able to get, in many regions, um, higher quality input data faster as a result of being able to spin up those servers in any given location on demand. So for example, for Australian forecasts, uh, there's a satellite in Japan that we depend on very heavily, the Himawari satellite, and we can actually base servers more geographically close to where that data is made available by the JMA, uh, the Japanese Meteorological Agency, to be able to get that satellite data faster, um, to download it from Australia or from the United States, um, you get maybe a tenth the download performance. And the size of some of this data is absolutely huge. And uh, by downloading it locally, we can often pay less for the download of that. Like the volumes of data can be so huge that it's um, quite expensive to transport. Um, uh, the same with the model initialization data. So whether you're getting it from the Deutsche Wetterdienst from ICON, whether you're getting it from the GFS, um, they release this data every three or six hours or something. And you're not the only person trying to get it. And so as soon as they release it at 3.37 PM or something, there's 10,000 weather companies, weather agencies trying to download that data as fast as possible. And we want to win that race. So we make sure to co-locate um, via the cloud our service as close as reasonably possible to where that data is available to make sure we get that race and get that model or win that race and get our models started forecasting using that data as soon as possible each morning. In terms of those parameterizations, um, it, it, is initially non obvious as to how uh, using the cloud enables us to make better choices there. But the answer is basically through back testing. So, because we have essentially unlimited compute power, um, we can just double our spend and get double the servers for 10 minutes and then switch them off again and go back to normal. When we come up with a new idea, maybe a better parameterization or a better way to do things, we need to make a decision is it actually going to be better in reality? And the way we're able to do that is just spin up. 1,000 computers, run the forecasts again for the last couple of weeks, immediately evaluate the results, um, and then see right away, is this going to make an improvement or is it going to make things worse? Uh, whereas if we just bought servers in a rack, either we'd need to buy a whole lot of servers just for this test, and then they'd sit there not used the rest of the time. And let's say we bought twice as many servers as we normally use, then if it we wanted to test across 15 days, it'd take 15 days, because we're able to simultaneously do the last 1,000 days if we want, 100,000 days. It doesn't doesn't make any difference, um, all the changes, how much money you spend. So that really gives us an edge, I think, in iterating our weather model um, to get better performance because we're able to actually test uh, these things uh, within a matter of hours rather than in months or weeks or days. So the cost of using cloud really is remarkable. Um, I would calculated when I was living in Sydney, the cost of using the local data centers there, I'd pay more just for the electricity than I would um, now paying for the servers uh, that we rent from the cloud. So a result of that is for much less money, we're able to get much more powerful servers and run them, um, run the weather models as a result in much higher detail uh, than we would if we just got servers in a rack. Um, so that really enables us to make big improvements there. And uh, the same with the forecast area. So we're able to cover really large forecast areas. We can stretch it across as many machines as we like to get the forecast out within whatever time is available um, and really get a, a good jump just by virtue of the, what cloud enables there in terms of the compute capacity. So we've talked a lot about weather models, but we haven't really talked much about weather forecasting. Um, and I think it's important to actually consider what matters when you're using a weather forecast. And the model is definitely important. Uh, if you have an incorrect model, then there's no point going any further. But it doesn't stop there. It continues. So most important, OK, let's have an accurate weather model. Um, next most important, well, the output of a weather model is just 
a three-dimensional grid um, with the temperatures this here and the moisture's that there. Um, it's not very interesting to look at. It's very hard to then determine, um, is it a good gliding day? Um, so taking that data and processing it into actual useful information, um, that's a really important step. And I think the second most important step I would have an accurate model. And of course, it's not just important to have useful information if it's very hard to read. So if um, you can only access it on your desktop at home um, or you need some special software, like maybe it doesn't run on a website or something like that, um, it really limits your availability to actually use that useful information. So it's important to have that data available everywhere possible, whether that's on your computer or even your phone or maybe even in the glider. So I think that's the third most important thing. And without all three together, I don't think you really have a good forecast. So let's talk about how we make that or how we try and make information useful within SkySight. So starting from that three-dimensional grid, these are the things we try and put together for you. And I've tried to spend a lot of time thinking about the information I've wanted as a competition pilot and talking to my colleagues and the information they want. But even more importantly is talking to um, just average pilots, people who are on their first solo, people who just fly on Sundays, people who do circuits around the airfield. Um, they're just as important as everyone else. And it's important that we try and provide forecasts that are useful to them. Um, and they're understandable to perhaps people who don't have a background in meteorology or computers or anything like that. So that's sort of an extension of the accessible forecast. If you need a PhD or something to interpret the forecast, is it really a good forecast? So the key thing, in my opinion, um, for designing a good interface for interpreting forecasts was to put it on a map people understand. So my personal bugbear is those um, stereographic projection forecasts. I think you get a lot of synap synop excuse me, synoptic forecasts in Europe with this stereographic projection where it's very hard to even tell land from sea, let alone find where you are and you are in relation to the front. So within SkySight, we use the Web Mercator projection everywhere. It's the same on Google Maps. If you can find your gliding club on Google Maps, you'll be able to find it on SkySight just the same. And of course, the only thing more important than terrain for gliding is airspace. So it's very important to be able to plan your task in relation to the airspace available, especially within Europe, less so than Australia. Um, so I think another really important thing is to try and slice up the forecast in as many different domains as possible. So we slice it here for you temporarily. So you give us a particular point and we give you throughout the hours of the day, slicing it temporarily, what the condition is going to be like for that point. So we can see uh, the thermal strength coming up through the day here. We can get a little breakdown of the high level, mid level, and low level clouds, whether the cumulus. We can see the height of thermals going up. We can see the surface temperatures, the dew point. It just gives you for one location, perfect for club flying, doing a solo flight, doing a local flight, um, or doing instructing on the weekend to tell you what the condition is going to be like for one area. Um, but then perhaps we want to go somewhere. So it's also important to be able to slice the forecast along the route you want to fly. So we designed a route forecast that lets you draw out little tasks. You just click out your turn points, one click, two click, three click home. And then we give you a slice of what the weather looks like along that route. So here we can see the red line is the top of, is the soarable height, the black line is the top of thermals, and the pink line is the condensation layer. So where the thermal tops go above the condensation layer, you can see this little area of cloud here. Just realized I don't think you can see my mouse on the live stream, so I'll stop trying to point where things are. Um, and we also see on the right there, uh, you see uh, the various start times. So it's suggesting that if you start at 11.30, you'll do 71 kilometers an hour, and it'll take you five and a half hours. And it automatically computes that for every half hour through the day. You can also see the little black line on the map, which is what we've calculated as an optimal track around this task using our potential flight distance data. So it's calculating what route it thinks is going to be fastest around e any given task. So if you give us a possible task, we'll tell you what we think is the fastest way around it. And you can click and see for any of those times in the top right corner what the route is um, for that speed calculation is done for you. Um, of course, planning routes uh, is not so useful if you're not doing it in relation to um, where you're actually trying to fly. So often you don't get to choose where you're going to fly, but you've given an area to fly or given a racing task, for example. Um, so we integrate with Soaring Spot, so all of your competition tasks automatically loaded into SkySight, and you can see right on top of um, the forecast what the task is, and you can do all of your planning in relation to that. And I think competition pilots, that's a really critical thing to have. Um, there's no point knowing the weather if you don't understand it in relation to your task. Um, so personally, I resent SKU-Ts because I think that um, 
the level of meteorological understanding that's required to be a glider pilot is perhaps higher than it needs to be. We should be trying to reduce um, the amount of information that's needed to go solo, for example. And I don't think skew T is something that should be included in that necessarily. Nevertheless, most glider pilots know how to read them. Some people even enjoy them, so we got them. Um, so if you're not familiar with how to read them, um, red here is the temperature, green is the dew point. We've got the pressure altitude on the left here and clipped off the screen on the right here is um, the altitude in feet or meters. The blue line is the wind there, and it's just showing you how these change um, through the atmosphere. So we can see where the red line and the green line meet. Um, the temperature is the dew point, so it's very likely we're going to have cloud there. And you can also see the pink line, which is the virtual parcel profile. That is, what would happen if we took a pocket of air on the surface, heated it up half a degree hotter than a stranding air? How high is it going to go? So we can see in this case um, that parcel of air is going to sail straight past the inversion and go all the way up to the stratosphere. So it's probably going to be a thunderstorm day. Um, for paraglider pilots in particular, um, we got this request for an idea of basically uh, that skew T chart, but instead of being for uh, just one, ti one time of day, could we have that for the whole range of the day? So we've built what we call the wind gram with that. So this is showing us uh, relative humidity. And you can see early in the morning, the surface there, that green blob. Um, so we've got the time on the bottom and altitude on the left. That green blob on the surface in the morning there, probably some fog or morning low cloud. And we see it starts to clear up a little bit. And then around about, uh, I think that's 4 o'clock there, we see this big mass of moisture moving through. I think in this case, there was a front going through about 4 o'clock. So you can see... It's like a wall of moisture from surface to the ceiling moving through. And then we see quite a moist air mass left behind and probably no soaring. Um, so I think it really gives you an idea for one point how the atmosphere above you is going to change through the day. And you can do this not just for relative humidity, but the temperature for atmospheric stability. So you can see how the inversion looks through the day. I think it really gives you a new understanding of what the weather is for your location. Um, of course, the weather forecasts aren't always right. Um, and it's important to understand when they're not right. And we provide that um, facility through our satellite forecast. So you can, or not satellite forecast, satellite images rather. Um, so you can turn on the sat view at any time, and that's going to show you the latest satellite photo for any of our forecast regions, integrated with the rain radar as well. And you can switch that on and off and see how it compares to reality in real time. Um, so if you, you can see if things are unfolding as they were predicted, or perhaps maybe the front looks like it's running half an hour, an hour behind, and you can make plans according to that. Um, one of our more recent innovations is our three-dimensional wave forecast. Um, so I think we're the first people to have done this. Um, I'm just going to try something a little bit tricky here. We're going to go over to SkySight in real time. I love doing live demos, least of all on a YouTube stream. And we're going to switch on the 3D wave forecast and look at the wave in New Zealand today. So it actually kicks us all the way into 3D. And then in theory, once it thinks for a little bit, it doesn't work so well on a one frame a second live stream, I think. Maybe we'll come back to that. Um, yeah, it shows us a view like this, where you can see that the structure of that wave lift in three dimensions there, uh, how it leans into wind, and you can pan and zoom and um, move around within that. I think that's a really interesting view. And it's still loading there. Um, in addition to that, we have wave cross sections. So it lets you draw a slice through that wave and actually see the structure of that wave relative to the altitude on the left there and the distance across the length of the line on the bottom there. And you can actually move your mouse along the length of that and get uh, an estimation of how strong the wave is at all these different heights. So here we can see a primary wave, a secondary wave, tertiary, quaternary wave. And we actually developed all of this wave forecasting functionality for the Perland project you might have heard of. It's a project to fly a glider to 190,000 feet. Uh, so we've worked with Perland for many years now to try and build the forecasting for them. And we were doing the forecast for them on the day they got the world record at 76,000 feet. And from what we've um, estimated from looking at the forecasts and the flight logs from the plane is 
usually even at 76,000 feet, the wave is within half a kilometre of where it was predicted to be. Um, we actually have one pilot, Dennis Tito, in the United States who we provide some special forecasts for. And he's done a 2,000 kilometre flight in the wave now, just following our forecast. Um, so he's got the forecast on his iPad there. You can see the little red line, that's his track. And they're flying blue wave, um, just following the red lines and the Sierras there, um, getting tremendous lift along the way. Um, in fact, they're actually flying at night now. Uh, so they've got night vision goggles. They're flying the blue wave at night. Well, they think it's the blue wave. You can't see clouds if they're there anyway. And um, they're doing these flights just off the back of our forecasts. Um, that flight analysis ability you saw just there with the track overlaid, you also get on the website as well. So you can upload your trace on top of uh, all of the charts, whether it's thermal charts or wave charts, and see how it relates to the reality. So here we can see a flight I did a couple of years ago. You can see where we've connected with the wave and where we haven't, and jumping over to the Pyrenees and back again. Um, it is important to understand, though, that you're looking at a flight over, say, however many hours you've flown, five, six, seven hours, um, but you're only looking at a chart for half an hour. So you didn't need to click through to the appropriate time um, to see whether the charts match up for that time. Um, but that's done for you automatically within the website. So you'll see in the little URL bar, at the, in the little um, time slider at the top, the time of your flight. And as you select your time, it'll show a position marker for where you were at that time and change the chart accordingly. Um, so we've got all that information that I think is useful information um, there for you. But then uh, how do we make that information available to people? Um, so the ways we've come up with to do that are firstly having it on every device possible. So whether you're on your laptop, on your iPad, or on your iPhone, we've got the forecast ready and waiting for you. And the website scales seamlessly between them. Um, you have access to just about every feature on every size screen. <coughs> but that's all good and well. Um, but if you're in the air, uh, how do you get access to that forecast? We've partnered with a number of people now. If you've got an UDI on hand, you can get our forecast downloaded onto the device and you can click on and see where the waves are. You can see where the convergence lines are. You can see where we think is fastest to fly just on a cross-country speed basis. And it shows up as red lines across the map there and you can steer yourself along those. And we have pilots who are finding really good results using this in competitions or just private wave flying. Uh, the same on your LX9000. Um, the LX9000, you can even update in flight. So you can be getting up-to-date information whenever we have a new forecast out, your LX9000 will get it. And you can get the satellite picture through us as well on your LX9000, which I think is just invaluable information while you're flying. Um, I was never a LX9000 user. I've always been a user of XCSOAR, um, but I've reached the end of my tether and now bought an LX9000 just because of the value of um, this information available. Um, if you don't have it, you're going to be left behind, I think. Um, if you prefer to use alternative software, perhaps you really like the flight planning in CU, um, we're integrated with CU as well, so you can get all of our forecasts within CU. So you can see here we're looking at the waves in the Pyrenees. Um, and if you perhaps don't have any of these fancy devices and you want the weather in flight, you can do that as well just through the SkySight website. So the first step is just to install it as a aggressive web app, um, which involves you click the little three dots, then go add to home screen and you get the app on your desktop and on an iPhone you click I don't know what this button is meant to be share or something and then click add to home screen and you get the icon on your desktop and when you reopen it you get a little download icon next to some of the parameters you can then download all the forecast charts and when you're in flight um, you can switch on airplane mode and I'm going to assume this is done in a two-seater while your co-pilot's flying you can check uh, your position there so you see a little blue dot where you are and reference yourself against the forecast and see, uh, are we in the wave? Are we out of the wave? Should we be a bit further upwind? Is there better queue at this place later in the afternoon? All this information available to you, even if you don't have internet. Um, so that's how I think we've made the information available to as many people as possible. I'd like to talk about just some of the new features we just worked on recently that I think are really taking forecasting for gliding to the next level. Um, so one of those is our integration with the Deutsche Wetterdienst. So we talked about the Deutsche Wetterdienst model. Um, it's a very high performance model they've put together. If you've used Top Therm or Top Task, you've utilized the benefit of their weather model. And we've actually collaborated with the Deutsche Wetterdienst since last year um, to develop a next generation forecasting system for them, which um, is via that integration we've built with SkySight and Deutsche Wetterdienst. Um, how that integration is going to continue, um, whether we'll start building more features that perhaps more like people coming from top task or top them are used to, or whether people like what we've built on top of it already. 
Um, we're looking for feedback on that, whether people like it, how it is, what people want to see. Um, but it's really enabled um, some options that weren't available to us previously just with the weather modeling we do. So when we get those initial conditions from a weather model, it's still another two or three hours perhaps before we get the forecast out. Um, but with uh, the Icon EU model coming out every three hours, we can show you that information right away. And that's quite detailed information. It's not perhaps enough information for wave or convergences, but for general conditions, that can be really interesting, really up-to-date data. So in really complex flying conditions, uh, that can be a real advantage uh, to have that information uh, super recent, super up-to-date. So you can change that just by clicking the toggle within um, SkySide at the top. You choose SkySide or Icon, and you can choose which weather model you prefer to see. Another thing we're working on is operational verification. So normally we just do verification from surface stations. So this is what one of my operational verification panels looks like. So we have one model here, which is uh, our model initialized just from GFS, and one model here, which is our model initialized just from ICON. And we can see how the performance compares to these models. So we have little dots depending on how far out the uh, temp uh, temperature or moisture is at a surface observation. And we produce pretty charts from that that let us make decisions about um, whether the model is performing correctly with changes we've made over time. Uh, and the really interesting thing is what we're working on now is to do that with the OGN as well. So we're automatically passing the OGN, keeping track of where people thermal, how high they thermal to, how strong the thermal is. And we're using that information uh, to drive decisions about whether we're making improvements or um, going backwards with the model. And I don't think anyone's done that before to make um, those kinds of calculations uh, in real time off uh, the OGN as to whether the forecast is performing or not. Another really cool feature I've been working on is the route suggester. Uh, so within SkySight now, you're able to actually pick um, a task, and you can see we've clicked here, clicked here, and clicked back again. And uh, it's suggested that black line of what it thinks is an optimal route around that task. So in this case, it's going a bit of a square shape around some kind of thunderstorm or some kind of strange outflow going on there, maybe some kind of interaction with the plateau. And you can actually see over time how route uh, matches up with, you see the little um, blue dot is the current glider position at any given time, how that matches up over time. Um, but the really cool extension of this that we then thought was possible was, what if I don't know what the best task is? What if I just want the computer to suggest a task to me? So now you can, when you just click on the route forecast, you can just give it one point and then go generate a task for me. So I'd like a medium triangle task, we click generate. And there it goes. It suggests right away for us a 570 kilometer triangle that it thinks is the best that is possible from your location through the day. And it's got the black line there that shows the optimal track and all the different start times and how fast it thinks you better go for one of those. And the really clever thing we've recently done is connecting that to the airspace. So we can consider the airspace when you're planning that task and consider the fact that you need to go around areas of airspace. And the algorithms we needed to employ for this um, it only came possible because I was reading some route finding algorithms um, for taxis in New York um, as to how they um, plan uh, how long it's going to take to get to a destination. And the really challenging thing is not actually how long it takes to get from A to B starting at a given time, but uh, to figure out if I'm going to arrive by 5 p.m., what time do I need to leave? And the challenge is you need to search every possible start time all the way to the end of that search to be able to figure out if it arrives before 5 p.m. Whereas if you just start from, I'm leaving at this time, search all these routes, and as soon as I get one that arrives, um, whichever one is the first solution is the correct solution, because we got there in the shortest amount of time. Doing it the other way is an infinitely more complex problem. Like um, It's uh, very much an NP-hard problem, and to solve that in real time is really challenging. Um, but we found some really new experimental algorithms. Um, it took us a long time to get it to work, and it's some really high-performance code and a lot of pre-processing. But as a result, we're now able to do a solution like this. And this is actually more or less a uh, perfect solution. That is, it's not an approximation. It's calculating based on the output of the weather model. This is the best solution that's possible. And that's actually toggleable. So if you have the airspace on, so you switch the airspace toggle on, it considers the airspace and the route planning. If you have the airspace switched off, it'll plow you straight to the middle of it. So if you've got a transponder and you're happy to talk to air traffic control, Good for you. Switch the airspace off and go through it. What I'd uh, really like to see, and we've been talking to some people about, is the possibility to do this on your device. Uh, so within 
uh, your device in the cockpit, you can say, I want to get to here. Tell me, do I go left around this airspace or right around this airspace? And uh, you should stay tuned for that. You should get your sky site description ready. Um, so that's what we've just been working on. Um, in terms of what's coming, um, both to sky site and to weather forecasting in general, there's some really exciting developments going on in the field. The biggest of which is uh, ensemble modeling. Um, so the idea behind ensemble modeling is, um, so when we do a forecast at the moment, we do what's called a deterministic forecast. So we take one set of inputs, we run the clock forward, and we see what the set of outputs looks like. But what if there's some uncertainty in those inputs? Like maybe we don't really know what the temperature is between these two forecast stations, or maybe this forecast station is pretty unreliable. Some days it says it's, sometimes it's overreading by a degree or underreading. So what if we uh, ran 10 models in parallel and we started one where it was 24 and a half degrees, then another where it's 24.6 degrees, and we ran these all in parallel, and maybe we'd mix in some with different parameterizations that were experimental or new or weren't well validated yet or some different input data. We can then collect the sum of all of these results and do some really interesting statistics about what weather, the weather might be. And that's how you're able to get information from your national weather service provider like there's a 60% chance of rain. And the way they've done that is they've run maybe 100 weather models and 60 of them said it's going to rain and 40% or 40 of them said it wasn't. So by doing those large numbers of weather models, um, we're able to get those statistics. So what is the chance of rain for a given point? How likely is it it'll get above 25 whatever degrees? Uh, what is the most likely result? So uh, instead of just giving you one outcome, we can say, well, the average of the outcomes was this or the average rainfall was this. And we can also give you uh, risk information, like um, there's a 98% chance it's going to be a nice day of soaring, but there's a 2% chance you're going to have massive thunderstorms that will destroy your glider. Uh, and you can make your decisions based off that. So ensemble modeling, um, currently the biggest challenge is running 100 weather models at once. So we spend huge amounts of money running our one weather model at the moment, and it's just not plausible to run 100 in parallel. So something has to give, and usually that is the resolution. So people run ensemble models at... Um, maybe an eighth or a half or a quarter of the resolution normally. And because the performance um, decreases exponentially as you increase the resolution, just quartering the resolution can let you run 20 or 30 or 50 models simultaneously. So by reducing the resolution and running more models in parallel, we can get more modeling going on and perhaps in some circumstances get a better result. Uh, so that's another really exciting thing as part of our integration with the Deutsche Wetterdienst um, is we're able to produce on a chart, I'm just going to skip forward another slide, like this, um, when you're looking at the potential flight distance from the Deutsche Wetterdienst within the sky site, um, you can see these question marks all over the, ch all over the chart. And that's showing this uh, base one here is the average result, what we think is most likely to happen. But then it's showing you with the size of the question marks what it, where there was a lot of variation within those ensemble members. So when through this area here, there was real changes. So some weather models said it was going to be great, some said it was going to be terrible. Um, so perhaps if you're on the edge here, you might still go uh, give it a consideration, go give it a try. But then if you're on this side where the question marks are smaller, we know that it's not going to be a great flying day. We're fairly certain of that. And certainly over here or out here, we've got much more idea what's going to go on. So the question marks get smaller until they disappear. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more of that within weather forecasting, particularly when we are able to leverage the support of nation state weather forecasts like uh, ICON who are already doing some of these ensemble modeling and we're going to be able to produce that data within the forecast. So like within the point forecast, for example, we're going to be able to show things like, well, the thermals are most likely going to be 7,000 feet, but there's a range of 6,000 to 9,000 feet or there's a possibility that the queue won't form in this area and things like that. Um, and I think that's going to change weather modeling for the better. And that is the consensus for... Um, Reasons much, uh, reasons much broader than just uh, soaring forecasts. So general weather forecasting is already seeing huge benefits from this ensemble modeling capacity. Um, you can really see here, for example, so this is um, a whole collection of ensemble models from ECMWF and NCEP. That's uh, the GFS model. And you can see uh, the blue one is just the average from that center and the red, uh, the blue one is the average from GFS and the red one is the average from ECMWF and the yellow is the average overall. And you can see all of the other ensemble members. So initially, they all agree quite closely. So this information is not always so useful for the day of flight, but particularly for day plus one, plus two, plus three, you can see the ensemble members really start to drift and you get massive differences in the outcomes, which is kind of a reflection of the chaotic nature of weather forecasting. 
So you can see where um, that statistical information gets more and more powerful as a result. Uh, so I think we're getting near the end here. I think that's all, folks. Um, so I think we've talked about what, um, how a weather model works, um, what are the important criteria that I've defined arbitrarily to um, evaluate a weather model are, and how I think SkySight meets those, both in terms of having a very high-performance weather model, but also uh, the tools we've built to try and give you a good weather forecast. Um, I encourage you to go give it a go yourself. The website is https colon slash slash skysite.io. Um, there's a free seven-day trial. Uh, give it a go. Give me an email letting me you know what you think of the service. And if you'd like to continue after that, it is 79 euros per year. Um, I'll throw it back to Dominique if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was really interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I think everyone at home did too. So yes, um, now is your chance to ask questions. Um, you already have a couple lined up. Um, if you're ready, Matthew, we've got a couple technical questions from Ben Will to start you off. He asks, which exchange techniques do you use in the boundary area of the model? Uh, I'm just having a read of those questions now. Uh, yeah, that is way out of scope what I want to talk about today, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I can send you some links that will take you, um, or it'll be a good month of bedtime reading, I think, on how these weather models work. Um, but if you just pull up the... Uh, the wharf model itself, um, we use the default dynamical solver, which is what's doing those parts of the equation for you. Okay. Um, so then we'll, we'll skip those very technical questions. I can answer the third question just briefly sure. for you there. I'm not sure for which scorer um, you mean to validate, but in terms of the language we use, uh, we do all of our post-processing in Python, um, shelling out to see where performance is necessary. Okay, and then we have another question from Sky Nomad Paragliding. He asks, hello, Matthew, what is the best way to calculate slash set the pilot slash uh, glider factor in the SkySide settings? Right. So um, for people who don't know, with those route forecasts when we're giving you a speed and also with the potential flight distance where we're giving you a number of how many kilometers we think you can fly, um, you can actually change those numbers by going to your settings and setting your pilot slash glider factor. Um, so if you set a value of 100, we assume you're a pretty good pilot who's flying a Ventus 2 uh, with 18 meter wings and 45 kilos of square meter wing ballast. Um, and we intentionally leave it a bit hazy as to um, what the scaling is around that, but it's basically linear. Um, so if you think you're about 80% in that kind of performance, set a value of 80 and that'll give you the results you want. Now, the reason we don't give any more detail on how you judge that is because really the glider factor is not super significant. Uh, the pilot factor turns out to be much more significant. And people get very upset if I tell them, well, um, perhaps if you you flew better, you'd fly faster or something like that. So uh, we try and leave it up to users to find a value that's appropriate for themselves. Okay. And um, next question comes from Philip Betke. I hope I said that correctly. He asks, does route planning and task planning work for slow paragliders as well? Absolutely. I'll just jump quickly over to the website now. Uh, so you can see, you can say, I'm in a paraglider, I'm in a hang glider, I'm in a sailplane, and all of those numbers are just accordingly. Nice. And so then, I'm sorry, this oh. 260K task is not going to be feasible for a little paraglider. <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> okay, and um, Jeffrey Banks asks, he, or he says uh, that they only have HRRR in Alaska. And he asks if there he asks if there are any other models that work in Alaska. Uh, so we don't run any models in Alaska. We leverage the HRRR AK model within Alaska. I'm not aware of anyone else really doing any forecasting at all for Alaska. Um, if there was other models out there, we'd be glad to integrate them for Alaska. But realistically, HRRR is one of the highest performing weather models in the world. Um, so I strongly recommend um, HRRR as the source of your weather information for up there. All right, and another question asks um, what your opinion is on AI or machine learning and weather modeling. Uh, I'm not convinced that AI is ready for the, I don't think uh, even the most powerful deep learning networks are capable of really resolving the influence of so many different variables through so many complex calculations on the outcomes for storing it. Um, I have seen a very interesting project called Paraglidable or something where people have tried to do that. 
Um, and it's very impressive, the infrastructure and architecture they've built, but I think the results have not been phenomenal. Um, but I think it will in the future one day happen that um, AI becomes a dominant force in weather modeling. But I think in most cases, we still know a little bit more than the computers for now. So uh, by manually programming things ourselves, we can get a better result. Interesting. Um, we have another question from Valerio Odone. He asks uh, if you compared the accuracy of SkySide top task and top <laughs> meteor forecasts. Well, I, I would never besmirch the work of my competitors, who I'm sure <laughs> work very hard on their products as well. Um, all I can say is I wouldn't be in this game if I didn't think I was delivering value to our customers. Um, and if I thought I couldn't produce the best product, I'd quit now. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> um, Ines Weber asks, uh, do you incorporate non-hydrostatic models in your WARF or RASP forecasts? Uh, that's one I can talk about with Ines offline. Uh, I can <laughs> send her the configuration of our weather model. I think that'll answer her question. All right, we'll leave it at that. Um, and let's see what else we have here. Um, Christian Dorans asks, which SkySight pages you use on the LX9000 and if there is an official LX profile to use? There's no official LX profile, but there will be an official SkySight profile once I get an LX9000 on my own. Um, but in the meantime, uh, when I've flown in gliders with LX9000s, uh, I usually use the convergence page uh, when I'm hoping to fly convergence and the wave page when I'm hoping to fly wave. and when I'm otherwise not sure, I have the XC speed chart loaded, which is where we try and calculate based on the strength of thermals, based on the height of thermals, based on the cloud base, based on the winds, um, based on any presence of convergence within the boundary layer, um, based on any ridge lift. Uh, we try and deduce all of that into one parameter for you. And you can actually see it on the website as well, uh, the XC speed chart. And it catches up. Yeah, so you can see we've condensed that all into one map for you. So perhaps you'd fly over here if you thought conditions were better over here uh, or over here or who knows. Um, so I think that's a really useful one to fly with just in general as your background if you're looking for more information. Um, but primarily myself, um, I just use the convergence and the wave forecasts and I uh, rely on my flight planning um, for where I've tasked and where I'm going to go. Very cool. All right. The satellite uh, images yeah. is also very useful as well, actually. Yeah. Um, another question from Captain Darkfly, nice username. Um, he asks, what do you think is SkySide's advantage above <laughs> Top Meteor, um, which is also done by glider pilots as far as he knows? Yeah, again, I, I wouldn't want to besmirch the work of any of my competitors. Um, I'm sure they work very hard there as well. Um, the things that I think SkySide does particularly well are our speed of development. So I feel like we're producing um, real measurable improvements to soaring that people can actually see year to year. And we always have something exciting to show people every time they come visit us. And I think the interactive and the intelligent functionality is something that really makes us unique amongst any providers. So things like that, uh, intelligent route optimization, the route suggester, interactions with the airspace, things like three-dimensional wave, I don't think anyone else is trying yet. Um, and I do apologize to our users in some regards that um, the, uh, the breadth of our development can be difficult for people to tag along with, that um, we're constantly trying to change and improve things. Um, but I also, um, we're trying to provide you the best service possible and uh, computers are moving very fast. Uh, the state of the art is moving very fast and we're trying to keep up. So uh, we're trying to provide you something um, that's moving much faster than say the pace of development of gliders. Uh, how long have you guys been working on um, the Prandtl wing glider? Um, well, that's a couple of years now actually. First development started in 2010, but we spent a couple of years, um, you know, getting one to four scale models, one to two scale models. So that took a long time. But now we're building yeah. the actual thing. Yeah. <laughs> but we might we might go into more detail on that in the in the future uh, Adafruit yeah. talk. We'll see. Yeah. But we're um, very fortunate within the software. The cycle of iterations is just so much faster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's uh, let's stick with SkySide for now. We have a couple more questions here. Um, Bruno Bonamin asks um, if there are any plans of implementing SkySight in XE SOAR. 
Um, so it's kind of hard for us to interact with um, projects without sort of a defined leader, I guess. Um, so XCSOR is an open source project. Anyone's welcome to contribute code. Personally, myself, I'm not a C++ programmer, which is what XCSOR is in, despite being a keen user of XCSOR. Um, I understand uh, two different users now have written somewhat working integrations with XCSOR, one of which uh, works quite well. So it uh, connects to our API, it downloads forecasts on the chart on the background. I think it's all in the forums of XCSOR. It's not in the official branch or anything. Um, if anyone wants to jump in and pick up that, uh, make it into the main branch of XCSOR, we'll gladly support you. Um, so it is usable, but unofficially. OK. Um, David Mellon asks, how accurate or tested are the root recommendations? He says he just tried it uh, for today in Ephrata, Washington. And either he's been really underestimating the potential or this is really optimistic slash impossible. Uh, well, I'd suggest uh, dialing down your pilot slash glider factor if uh, <laughs> it's unattainable for you. Um, <laughs> uh, but certainly, I've tested it within my personal experiences. Um, the other thing to consider is that the route forecaster has no understanding where it's unlandable for you. So perhaps there's areas you don't want to fly due to risk to your personal life, like uh, through parts of the Alps or certainly through parts of Washington there. Um, and it has no means to understand that or perhaps know that you're not comfortable to fly a couple of hundred kilometers, two and a half thousand feet above ground or something like that. And we have another question from Valerio Odona. Uh, he asks if you could make a good forecast by searching for a day in the past years with possibly similar initial conditions. Um, well, the problem would be utilizing the observations from that day because the quality of the observations in the past and even in the present is still not really good enough, I think, to make such predictions. Uh, but that is kind of what deep learning tries to do itself, the whole AI uh, approach is it's looking through the past, say, 10,000 days forecasts and looking at what happened and trying to train itself on an outcome like that. So one day that'll be the future and that'll be what happens. But um, I don't think it's the right way to, right approach at the moment. <laughs> OK, and we have another question from Philip Betke. Um, he asks, it's, uh, I have to wrap my head, head around this, rather complicated. Could you score for competition something like uh, soaring quality over time and course? versus mm -hmm. time and come up with value that appreciates the pilot that was fastest for the worst weather. It'd be a very interesting comp competition if you <laughs> scored people for how well they flew relative to the forecast weather. I wonder if the best strategy would be to intentionally fly through the worst weather possible or something. Um, <laughs> uh, if someone wants to try that, I'm happy to give them some data to play with, um, but it's not something I've got time for, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right, awesome. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's the questions we have. Um, so yes, again, Matthew, thank you very much for your time. Thank you at home for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed it. Again, leave us your feedback in the comments. Um, next week, we're going to have a talk in German again. But for those English speakers, do not despair, we definitely have more English talks queued up and we'll, um, yeah, we'll, we'll release those details soon. So take care, stay healthy, and I'm going to tease next week's talk in German. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Nächste Woche besucht uns virtuell Benjamin Bachmeier. Benjamin Bachmeier ist einer der neugierigsten und aktivsten Alpen, Alpensegelflieger vom Segelflugzentrum Königsdorf. Viele kennen ihn sicher von seinem Blog flugfieber.wordpress.com, in dem er über das Fliegen schreibt. Der Vortragstitel wird sein zwischen Wunder, Wagnis und Wissen, moderne Ansätze im Gebirgs- und Wellensegelflug. Benjamin wird das Ganze auch aus einer eher wissenschaftlichen Sicht äh, aufwickeln, da er selber Luft- und Raumfahrttechniker ist. Wir freuen uns, wenn ihr nächste Woche wieder dabei seid. Bleibt gesund. Wir sehen uns. Tschüss.